starting. Hi everyone and welcome. I am so thrilled to be here today with Jacqueline Novogratz of Acumen. This conversation has been six years in the making and I'm so excited to introduce Jacqueline to you and her new book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. So welcome Jacqueline, we're so thrilled to have you today. Thanks so much, Carrie, it's a real privilege. Great. And uh, we have folks joining us from all over the world across the United States and in many countries globally. So welcome. We are thrilled to have you here today. I'm gonna to kick off by just sharing with you a little bit about Jacqueline's background. She, her work began in 1986 when she quit her job on Wall Street to co-found Rwanda's first microfinance institution. And the experience inspired her to write a bestseller called The Blue Sweater, which is an amazing book that I highly recommend, and also to create a wonderful organization called Acumen. And when Jacqueline founded Acumen in 2001, very few people had heard the words impact investing. Today, Acumen has invested $128 million to build more than 128 social entrepreneurs across Africa, Latin America, South Asia, and the United States. And these companies have leveraged an additional $611 million and brought basic services like affordable education, healthcare, clean water, energy, and sanitation to more than 260 million people. Jacqueline has been named to Fast Companies and Acumen's one of the world's most 10 most innovative nonprofits. And in my role at the Global Good Fund, I often get asked, you know, have you heard of Acumen? And of course, uh, most people on this call have heard of Acumen and the response is yes, the Global Good Fund and many of the enterprises that you lead who are listening wouldn't exist without acumen paving the way for social entrepreneurs globally. So thank you, Jacqueline, for all you've done to make the world a better place to be. Thank you, Carrie, to everyone here too. Thank you for the work you do. And um, Carrie, really, I'm just so blown away by everything you've built. Thank you, Jacqueline. So I thought I would, before we just dive straight into questions, uh, share with you all a little story about how Jacqueline and I first met. Uh, even though I really met Jacqueline, Jacqueline, uh, doesn't realize that I met her or didn't meet me, but here's a story. You know, I was just starting to build the Global Good Fund. This was about eight years ago. And I found this amazing conference in New York City that was for social entrepreneurs. And I saw that Jacqueline and other heroes of mine were speaking. And so I could not for the life of me figure out how to buy tickets online. So it didn't dawn on me that this was by invitation. And so I uh, got a little suitcase and took a train to New York uh, with some of my <laughs> colleagues at the Global Good Fund. And we, we arrived and went up to the booth and said, we'd like to buy three tickets. And they said, that will be $20,000 each. <gasps> I thought I'd misheard. Um, and so I said, how much? And they confirmed. So I went and sat in the hotel lobby, the restaurant area. And it turns out they had screens all you know, television screens set up all around the lobby. And I got to hear Jacqueline speak, uh, which was so exciting because that's why I was there. And people had left their um, agenda books and the names of folks in the agendas. So I got the whole experience and who should walk out but Jacqueline. So I, Jacqueline, I got to see you years ago and six years later, eight years later, here we are um, getting to speak. I've continued to follow you and be inspired by your work since, and I couldn't be more thrilled and honored to have this conversation today. So let's dive in. What an awesome story. Where are we taking the train in from? Washington, DC. So thank I goodness it wasn't too long ride, but uh, I got to see you and here we are having an exchange. So dreams do come true. And um, to everyone out there listening, I know you're, you're inspired and um, want to hear from Jacqueline. So let me start off with some questions. And I'd encourage all of you, you know, to submit your questions uh, live and that we'll try to incorporate them along the way. And we'll leave some time at the end to ask Jacqueline, changing the world for the better can be such a daunting task, as you well know. And many of the people listening today are social entrepreneurs who have already taken a dive out of this airplane and are building a parachute on the way down. 
How do you break down this big daunting challenge of making the world a better place into smaller attainable steps? Um, well, Carrie, in some ways you should be answering this question because um, you're the one that took a hundred dollars and turned it into $2 million and started the work that you do. I, I think it comes down to um, just starting and um, seeing, a, seeing a, a problem around you as an opportunity and taking one step toward that problem. The other thing I wanna say is that in my own life, I've, I've, I've also learned that some of the seemingly smaller things that I've done have not only taught me the most, but they've changed lives and, and they've created my deepest memories and sense of self. I think of uh, having a job that I wasn't happy in, um, but I felt this obligation to stay. And I and I had I volunteered for this youth entrepreneurship organization in Harlem in the early '90s, and got this idea that well, these kids don't really understand how business works, nor do they have really good math skills. So maybe we could do both at the same time. And I just started a greeting card company with this a bunch of twelve-year-olds, and. Um, and we rocked it. And I started to understand if we could build um, within a community beauty and goods that, that we could export out of the community, not only would we be bringing income into the community, but we would be sending a message of what children were capable of doing. And, um, and it didn't fundamentally change the world, but it's part of acumen today. And I have so many experiences like that, Carrie, where I just saw an opportunity that others might see as a problem. And I took it on, like you. And so when you saw that opportunity, you, you tried to do something about it and just take a first step. And it, it, was, you didn't, it wasn't daunting in that way, it sounds No, it was, it was tiny. It was bite-sized. Um, okay. Same with when I started the microfinance bank in Rwanda. On, on the one hand, it felt big. On the other hand, it was so insane that a 25 year old would deign to start a bank um, with three years of banking experience <laughs> that I thought, well, what can I lose? Um, no, nobody else is doing it. And so I just started talking to people and things led to things. And Goethe's right. You make a commitment and the universe conspires to make it mm -hmm. happen with you. And um, as we were building this microfinance bank, all of my assumptions that women would also create jobs, not just businesses, went out the window. And they and I thought, well, someone's got to build a business that actually employs people. And so maybe I'll just do it. And so um, my side hustle was starting this little bakery with 20 unwed mothers. Hmm. Um, and we ended up cornering the snack food business in Kigali. Um, that also fundamentally changed me. And in, in many ways, Carrie, I feel, and I'd be interesting to hear how you feel because you're so much younger, but in many ways, I feel that I apprenticed for 15 years, taking on these different dreams and enterprises and some failed and some succeeded. Many of the institutions still exist, but it was all on the path of getting me ready for acumen, mm -hmm. um, which I couldn't have done had I not taken the smaller steps. We actually had a question from the audience that is relevant to this. And you were saying how this, these experiences really changed you. And the question from the audience was, you know, how have you been personally formed or transformed by your organization and the, organ the vision of your organization? Mm. Actually, it makes me cry. Um, it's funny, on every level. I can't even, it would take me hours um, on the, on the tough side, um, when you go into building companies that are bringing clean water and housing and electricity and healthcare and education to the poor, um, it necessarily requires a level of idealism that this is about spreading goodness. And no one tells you that these are some of the dirtiest, most corrupt, uh, toughest businesses out there. And so um, I think it's transformed me in that I've had to learn how to play with the tough guys and um, 
and and learn what it truly means you know the words do what's right not what's easy mm-hmm. those words are are easy to say and they are really hard to live um so it's i've been transformed in that i've gained a confidence um uh and a knowledge of where i i start and end what i will um open myself to and where you will not move past mm-hmm. and on the on the opening side you know I never thought we'd be working in Pakistan. It was a country that has fundamentally influenced who I am and my understanding of the world. Um, the religions, the, the, the people that I have gotten to know uh, who all live inside of me. And frankly, when I started Acumen, I, I wanted to make change, but it was a few years in when we had invested in a bed net company and I saw us go from zero to 10,000 jobs and 30 million bed nets a year where I thought, well, you could really do this. Like you can really change a sector and then you can change a system. Um, yes. So I could go on and on, but in, in ways that, most ways that I would never have expected at the start of the journey. You know, one of our board members recently said to me, uh, sometimes you give a lot more to the organization and sometimes the organization feeds you, gives to you. And I've really found that to be true, especially during tough times where you, you know, you're, you're constantly thinking about other people and giving and yet uh, the organization carries your spirits um, during particularly tough times. So um, I was curious um, today, we're living through a time when everyone is in need of hope and inspiration from topics of you know, social injustice that are on the forefront and have been for a long time, but are becoming uh, visible, increasingly visible to more people um, and the pandemic that's raging across the world. You know, as a social entrepreneur, people often look to you for hope. How do you navigate that balance of struggling yourself as a human being, living through really tough times while also striving to be you know, a pillar of hope and strength for other people? Mm-hmm. I would actually say that when I err, it's on the, um, I'm being so hopeful that people don't know what to do with it. Um, And so um, I think one of the great lessons I've learned has been to acknowledge the hurt and the pain and the the ugly in our midst, that I'm so wired to see every problem as an opportunity that I am like, well, look, but we can do this. You know, so what the roof is God, you know, now <laughs> we can build, <laughs> we can turn the thing into a swimming pool. And sometimes everybody just looks at you like, seriously, can you, can we just acknowledge how much this hurts? And that's been part of my learning journey. When it comes to my own hurts, you know, e- even there, I would say it's been learning to actually express the vulnerability mm-hmm. and, um, and you know, my husband really helps surrounding yourself with uh, people who love you for no reason other than the fact that you're you and believing it. We have um, shared experience there that, you know, especially as you're navigating all the different parts of being a social entrepreneur and, and the people you're surrounded by change as you go through life and there are certain people who stay rocks and you know really consistent. Um, and it's something that we're finding um, as we talk to the social entrepreneurs today in preparing for this conversation, having really strong support systems has been one of the things that have really helped them propel, you know, strong personal support systems have helped them propel their social enterprises to the next level. We've really, I couldn't agree more. We've really started to understand in a much deeper way um, the idea of accompaniment, that this work is too hard to do by yourself. We need people to be on the, on the journey with us. And um, again, early on in Acumen's trajectory, I started to really get interested in the psychology of all of our entrepreneurs and how many of them would self-sabotage. Um, they would start to be really successful and then they would go AWOL. And, um, and I would try to understand, you know, was it their success that actually they feared? And could you help unpack that? Um, or 
they would um, start off with two great friends, but never do the real work of what it means to partner. And as you said, get get whether it was successful or, or hit hard times and the whole partnership would fracture. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen both success and failure be times of real test of character. Mm -hmm. And if you can have someone who cares about you and the venture, and I do think you have to make a commitment to the entrepreneur and to the venture uh, and speak truth, then you're in a much better place to actually help move these companies to the next level. Um, and for the entrepreneur, I think it's so important for every social entrepreneur to find even that one person as mm -hmm. a who's not just a sounding board, but who's a truth teller. Um, because your friends uh, who are your critics um, often help you in, in ways that you're just plain old critics don't do it all. And certainly not the psychophants who tell you you're doing a great job no matter what. Um, you want people to tell you the truth. Even when it uh, sometimes, are, you know, it hurts, um, but people who are helping. Especially when it hurts. Right, and people are sharing because, because they can help. Um, and care enough to say, be honest. Yeah, yeah I, I can relate and, to that. And even as we give, I mean, it's board members too, to find, you know, one of my board members, Stuart Davidson, I used to tease him and say, you're my favorite curmudgeon because you tell me everything I'm doing wrong. But in the next sentence, you ask how you can help me do it right. And um, that's a great board member. You know, Jacqueline, you talked about the importance of building relationships with other people as individuals. And we have a question from the audience here about building relationships with other social enterprises. Um, can you share how is social entrepreneurship and particularly those organizations that support social enterprise different from other industries with respect to collaboration versus competition? Hmm. I, I would actually say it depends. One of the, um, I think one of the, uh, the pitfalls, the potential pitfalls um, where we have real vulnerability as a sector is that many of us um, see ourselves in a resource scarce environment. And so particularly when you're young and you're trying to build something and you want people to listen to your mm -hmm. idea, which in and of itself will be a crazy idea that nobody will understand anyway, for the most part, um, that that can create a sense of competition just at the point where there's real possibility for collaboration. I saw that in myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet there's such goodness amongst people in the social entrepreneurial sector that there's real opportunity to be better together than we are by ourselves. And so organizations like yours, Carrie, um, Acumen Fellows programs that build natural cohorts so that we can find those real touch points for collaboration when they make sense, mm -hmm. um, then I think we become unstoppable. Uh, but it means, it means creating that ecosystem and reinforcing a narrative of that there's abundance here and getting really clear that it makes no sense to collaborate because a donor or an investor thinks you should collaborate. It only makes sense to collaborate when you have a shared North Star, a shared vision, a shared sense of um, a, a shared value, values alignment. And, um, and otherwise it's better to cheer each other on. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would say that's different. For Acumen, because our capital is 10 to 15 years patient, we had to learn early on that we were marrying these entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the, there's real relationship. Um, I've watched young men come out of universities and, and you know, go bald along the route of, you know, and they'll say, yeah. how patient is your capital? It's like, well, here he is before. Really patient. After. <laughs> Have children. Right. But that is, it's profound. And when they succeed, it's a shared success. And so I think that's the promise of our sector that to change systems, not just build companies, will require an ecosystem to function, operate, share, and build. And I'm 
thrillingly seeing more of that now than 20 years ago when we started. Um, and I really liked what you said around this mindset of abundance. And we're seeing that, you know, you said you're seeing that more now. And I think, you know, many of the people in today's audience, we have hundreds of people here who are young social entrepreneurs. I am curious, you know, how did you position yourself when you were a social entrepreneur just getting started? You know, one of the biggest challenges that I often see with young innovators is a lack of confidence. And these social entrepreneurs are poised and honest, tell the truth, just like you shared, they have great energy and sometimes lack confidence. And I'm curious, you know, what advice would you give about how to be humble yet confident um, and how you positioned yourself when you were just getting started? Um, I see myself in so many of the young social entrepreneurs I get to meet um, with that sense of everything is possible and, um, and, and you should never change that because people who are real will also see it in you and people, we bet on people. We don't bet on spreadsheets and projections and the older right. we get, the more we, we do that. Mm -hmm. um, but confidence and courage are very similar. And so I think a lot of social entrepreneurs, and I'll speak for myself, I had extraordinary confidence on, in, on one level in that I thought nothing of moving to a country, you know, pre-internet, you know, um, you were very brave. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy, but that wasn't cur courage for me. That was adventure for me. Um, the courage was speaking truth to power. The courage was asking people for money for my own organization. The courage um, was, um, you know, uh, kind of withstanding the fact that when I was building that little bakery, everyone called me the town Girl Scout. The men would call me Msichana Kidogo because I was, which means little girl in Kiswahili. Mm -hmm. um, why are you hurting, you know, you're ruining the women in our community. And um, I'd say, well, I'm working with the women. And so what I've come to learn is that all of us have different muscles where we have confidence or courage and other muscles that need exercise. Um, they're weaker. And I would say practice, you know, practice it. And the more you practice it, do small things, the more you become it. Um, for me, I didn't have any confidence in public speaking at all, but I would practice and practice and practice. And then I would um, give a tiny speech to try to articulate what I was saying. And mind you, I was having to do this in French and I hardly spoke French. Um, but people could see just how earnest I was, just how honest I was. And um, even though they would say, well, you got to work on your French because you weren't actually talking about goats. You were talking about <laughs> illegal alcohol, but you know, we're, we're backing you. Yeah. And I, that then, then you realize they see, they see that I want to do the right thing. And, um, and then when you win something, you get more confident. Right. But I don't think at all, it's, it's ridiculous to think that when you're young with an idea that nobody believes in, that, um, that you're gonna have all the confidence you need. And frankly, there's probably a bigger risk, which is overconfidence, because that breeds certainty, arrogance, and a lack of listening. And mm -hmm. what the social entrepreneurs I know who are most successful start with a real sense of the confidence and the, the audacity to know you can change the world. And that takes a serious level of um, ambition, audacity, mm -hmm. but true humility that you don't have the answer. You need to listen to other people. And um, you're probably going to go two steps forward, one step back for a long time. I was thinking, Jacqueline, about uh, my own journey getting started and how uh, I wanted to build confidence asking for money to raise capital. And so I would go to the grocery store and find produce or um, meat that was um, about to expire the same day or the next day. And I would go up to the register and ask for a discount. Um, and it was my way of a small, you know, even if it was 10 cents discounted, it was a win that I could claim and build confidence and uh, learn how to ask for money. So 
Um, I can really relate to what you were describing as, you know, just getting out there and trying and starting somewhere and practice, the more you practice, the more confidence you start to build. I love that. Carrie, if we're going to share tips, <laughs> please. Yeah. Um, someone told me early on, because I would ask for money and then I would feel such empathy for the person because I had just made them uncomfortable that then I would start talking. Um, and then I'd walk out of the room and I, I never got their answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, a, a wise person said, make the ask and then make sure you have a glass of water and then just sip and count to 10 in your mind. And I did that a few times. And then I realized that silence is your power. Mm -hmm. Don't fill the space. You've made the request and you're actually giving them a gift. So let them decide. And um, that took a little bit of practice. It's obviously working quite well though. And the message there is, you know, let silence is okay and practice and let there be quiet. Um, that's a really And remember tip. that most people are too busy worrying about themselves to worry about you. So don't think about what other people are thinking. Right. And, and that you may be helping them move their resources to something that they really care about, right? You are helping them. Right. You are helping them. You're giving them a gift. And Jacqueline, you've been involved in giving gifts and with this really important work for decades. So I'm curious, you know, how you're clearly still passionate, excited, motivated. How have you stayed so positive along your journey, especially when I'm sure at some points people have tried to break you down or it seemed that you weren't moving or growing as quickly as you wanted to be? Um, well, I, one of the great privileges of my life is I work with the most extraordinary human beings on the planet and, um, and the community just is layered and layered and layered. And so there's always people I look to who just continually inspire me. Um, in those moments where you feel broken, and there are those moments where you feel broken. Um, and sometimes it's for something that happened that you had nothing to do with, mm -hmm. but the world has done to you. Um, you know, starting a bank with a group of people I loved and then seeing the country explode into genocide, well, that was an incredibly low, uh, I mean, it's almost embarrassing to use that word. That was just a horrendous time. Um, but in those ways for me, and everyone's different, for me, I go back to the idea of purpose. Um, and in a way it's almost spiritual, Carrie. It's, it's this, I do this work because in the, my soul, I believe that we are all connected to each other, to all living things. And that the opportunity that we have is to use the privilege that we've been given to do the most, make the most change that we can make. Mm -hmm. And, and I asked myself, you know, have I shown up? Have I done it? Have I, could I have tried harder? And um, pretty much I could, usually couldn't have tried harder. Right. And, um, and then go for a run, read poetry, uh, recognize the beauty that has been part of this journey and is frankly part of every day that's around me. It, it's almost like a, a touchstone that takes me back to the why of this work um, and the recognition that this work may not be manifest exactly tomorrow as it is today, nor even in the same organization, but this is my work mm -hmm. and I am on this path. And Jacqueline, you've written a bit about that path in Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, your new book. And in the book, you highlight 12 practices of moral leadership. I'm curious if you had to choose one or two practices of moral leadership that have made all the difference in your career, which ones would those be? I, it, it's funny, I've, I've pretty much already talked about them. The first is this idea of moral imagination, this, and it, and it almost goes to every question that you've asked, Carrie. The, the first is the humility to see the world as it is, that there's a, there's a clear eyed recognition and understanding of who people are. Mm -hmm. um, 
why they do what they do in the United States today. Um, to pretend that a certain one group is one thing and another group is another thing isn't going to get us anywhere. The, the humility to see the world as it is, is to have the curiosity to go to what I think is the second most important um, trait and that's to listen. And to listen, not from a place of certainty that I am right, you are wrong. Um, and if I can only convince you, <laughs> then you'll, you'll see the light. But rather, um, I wanna know who you are. I wanna understand what makes you move, why you value things, why you don't value things. And as painful as it is, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to acknowledge even a partial truth in what you say. Because in that lies a real sense of respect and dignity, which is what I think we want. We want to be seen. So one moral imagination that you've got this courage and this confidence to see the world you want to build, but you are clear-eyed as can be about the world you are in. Mm -hmm. And to the learning how to listen um, with all parts of your whole body, listen to, with your whole self um, to what a person is telling you, what they're not telling you. Uh, what their body language is telling you. And um, if you can do that really well, you can build a business or an organization, certainly a social enterprise um, that will actually serve the people you came to serve in relationship. Um, and it's not about helping. It's not about saving. It truly is about serving and making that commitment to not just their dignity, but your own dignity. And I think it's in that interchange that we find it. One of our listeners today has a question. She's based in Africa and she asked, what do you think is the key pointer secrets for female entrepreneurs in order to excel, particularly interested in female entrepreneurship? Um, I, I, I think this is an amazing time for women to be um, out there in the entrepreneurial space. Um, women typically um, are listeners, are relationship driven and are good at multitasking. And, mm -hmm. um, and something I've been thinking a lot about and I may write about is this idea of outsider leadership. That, mm -hmm. um, that in an interdependent world that we are in right now, the more layers of your identity that live with inside of, live inside of you um, that are outside of the dominant um, structure of society, the more you can understand those who've been outside the dominant structures of society. So for example, I grew up um, at a time where when I worked at Citibank, I was one of 17, um, I was one woman of 17 executives and, um, and the only way that I could really succeed was to fully understand the, the world of male bankers, um, how they talked, how they made decisions, um, what was acceptable, how I had to be so that they could hear me. They didn't need to do the work to figure out um, how to code switch or translate what I might be saying. Right. And it actually gave me a superpower because it's easier for me to sit in a room and really understand who is sitting with what vulnerabilities, who is lacking all confidence maybe because of where they sit and can I go out of my way to pull them in um, in a way that somebody who just assumes the world works for them mm -hmm. might not see. Mm -hmm. And of course that's generalizing um, except to say that if you can tap into those parts of yourself who have been an outsider or felt like an outsider and every woman on the planet can relate to that, um, then we can look at it as a liability or we can look at it as a superpower. And, um, and if we've got lots of layers, then that power can become exponential. Jacqueline, I love the stories that you weave together in your book that show how these powers become exponential. Um, and they're stories of people that are based all over the world. Um, and I think the stories in your book 
help demonstrate that's not not all the answers are in America. We have a lot of people listening in who are from all over the world and you and I know that not all the answers are in America. There's inspiration to be taken from all over the world and applied all over the world. Um, we know there are a lot of problems around the corner as well as in many other places. And I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you started your journey with a pull toward global issues. Why did you start there? Um, so remember, I grew up at a time of real separation. Um, my dad had gone to Vietnam um, actually three times. Um, and so I was really intrigued by the, the whole world. But we didn't have enough money. I, I, the first time I was on an airplane was um, when I was at university. And um, the first time I ever left the country was with Chase Manhattan Bank, my first job. I went to Singapore. And um, I loved the world. I wanted to know the world. And, um, and the Jesuits have a saying um, that go to where your, um, your deepest yearning meets the world's greatest need. And my deepest yearning was to know this whole big world of ours um, and to love it. And so um, it only made sense to me that I was going to, you know, go both on an adventure and mm -hmm. in a way that I would serve. And when, when, when Martin Luther King talks about justice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, um, I actually think that there's great truth to that if we see ourselves as truly interconnected across the, the world, that we're going to other places to, um, to change people, to save them, to help, that's toxic. But if you are going to serve um, and you enter as a guest and you realize that, that you are only there as a guest, um, over time you really can be um, taken as a local, become part of the fabric um, as they become part of you. And, um, and I really see that as part of uh, what we could be as a world. When I was around 30, um, my mentor uh, said to me, you know, I love that you're such a, a global soul, but you will understand the world better if you understand your own country in a deeper way. And, um, and at first I was a little taken aback because I thought, of course, I understand my own country. And I spent the next few years um, traveling around the United States. I was at the Rockefeller Foundation, um, sitting on factory floors, working on Native American reservations, um, starting a greeting card company in Harlem. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I got to see this country that I had grown up in. And it not only gave me more credibility in other parts of the world, but it helped me understand more. And it was interesting where you started, Carrie, because Acumen now, um, which started globally, mm -hmm. now has um, Acumen American and, and you and, and Acumen are co-invested in Isusu, which is an awesome company. Um, it means a lot to our, um, our regions where we operate that we also recognize the poverty and the mess that the United States has on its hand. And just as I would talk about outsider leadership, so do I believe that the innovation that we are going to see at the world will come at the edges. And that this is a moment for, for America to look outside and see what innovations um, have been created in um, more resource scarce societies. Um, that can teach us everything. One of the themes I just took from what you said is about mentoring and how you, you're, no matter where you go, it seems you're always learning and you're soaking in and that mentors may come in some untraditional forms from how you'd expect. Would you talk a little bit about the role of mentoring in your life and, and why it's so important, especially as we have to our audience here of emerging social entrepreneurs, uh, mm. what the role of mentorship might be? Yeah. You know, and I was just actually talking to one of the world's great um, educators, and he said that for all of the conversations that we want to have about what really differentiates um, a person's success um, possibilities, um, that there is really one single 
differentiating factor, and that's to have a human being in your life who believes in you. And, um, and that couldn't be truer for people who venture out on a path of entrepreneurship because we're truly creating our own paths by definition. And so ensuring that you've got people who truly believe in you, even if they don't fully understand your idea, mm -hmm. um, which was the case with me, uh, is everything. And so the, the, the person who most impacted me in my life was, was an older man named John Gardner, um, uh, who I had no idea who he was when I met him. I was at business school, but he ended up being an advisor to every president from, I believe, um, President Johnson to President um, Ray Bush. And, um, and I wasn't that that wasn't really my world, um, American presidential politics, but he had integrity. He understood crossing lines of difference. He was a community builder and he saw something in me that helped me see it in myself. And, um, and I never made a big decision without going to John. I didn't, I didn't always take his advice, um, but it was important to me that he knew that I wanted to hear his advice. And it was important to me to hear that advice. And he would say things to me like, um, when I would say, should I do this really fancy job or should I do this really boring thing? And he'd say, well, where will you um, be more interested? Because you should not take a position just because it will make you interesting. And that just that phrase, focus on being interested, not interesting, shaped my life. And so I was very lucky in that way. And I, when I saw him and knew he was out of wisdom, I asked him to be a mentor. Now, I would say I'm mostly mentored by younger people. Um, and I think this also goes to how we accompany each other. Some of the entrepreneurs at Acumen, um, Javad Aslam, I just spoke to yesterday. I've been part of his work for the last 15 years. And, um, and now I probably ask him for more advice, help. Can you talk to this young person that he asks of me? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is um, the ethos of how we do the work we do, not just what we do, ultimately will de determine how deeply rooted um, the change we wanna make becomes because it doesn't then depend just on you and your team's efforts, then there's a, a deep cultural understanding and ethos that exists in people across um, an ecosystem that is, is connected by values, not by walls, or certainly not by race or class or religion or ethnicity. And, um, and I think that's what the world needs right now. I really resonate with what you're saying about, you know, having mentors and trying to um, provide guidance and, and uh, that the relationship evolves <laughs> over time um, and surrounding ourselves with people as social entrepreneurs who can help build us up um, and really be a support system and speak truth and give feedback, whether you choose to take it or not. Um, we have a question from the audience on this theme, which is how do you decipher critical feedback that is good for you in the moment? How do you discern when people's intentions are, what people's intentions are when they give feedback, whether they're, they have your best interests in heart, at heart or not? Hmm. That's such a, a, a great question. And I would say early on, I sometimes um, listen too well. Um, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm my toughest critic. And so when someone would give me a critique, I would really listen almost too much. Um, and that again is where mentoring, mentorship can be really useful. Um, and the confidence building that, that you start to recognize patterns and, and realize that it's important when you're listening to the criticism that you actually understand where a person is coming from or what their own motives might be. And, uh, 
and I got very used to, particularly with Acumen's model, where I would say, we're going to take philanthropy and then we're going to make long-term investments and any money that we get, we'll reinvest. And they would say, well, you obviously don't understand business. And, you know, I would wake up at night and think like, well, maybe he's, maybe he's right. And then I'd wake in, in the morning, I'd like, he is so not right. And your whole reason for being here is to prove that he is not right. Um, and so it's, it's that conversation with yourself, but when you get really unsteady, a conversation with someone who does have your interests at heart um, to put you back on the road. And I think um, that motive, it motivated, sometimes when you get this critical feedback that's maybe not coming from a great place, it, it actually is motivation to focus on being interested and focusing on what you really care about and learning um, and just diving right sure, in. You gave such a great point. It's like, well, why am I doing this? And is he right? Because there's, there's often truth in what people tell you. Um, but what kind of truth? Is it useful? Right. I love that you said that. Yeah. Jacqueline, we have a question about uh, from the audience asking, what worries you about our future in these uncertain times? And, and what gives you continued hope? <sighs> Um, what worries me right now goes back to ethos. Um, what worries me is that we are um, unequal, we're divided, we're divisive, um, and we've got the biggest uh, challenges of multiple generations in front of us, um, not just COVID, but climate and, and the inequality. Um, and when when people are in times of fear and anxiety, it is so easy for leaders to blame other people um, for the problems that are out there. And it is so important that we remember who we are, mm -hmm. that we need each other to do this bridging work. Um, it's the most important work that we could be doing. And I'm, I'm seeing a rigidity and a righteousness um, certainly across the, the right and the left in the U.S., I'm seeing it in every country. Um, you know, in Ethiopia, we've got the largest chicken factory, farm, not factory, farm in the country, serving about 25 million smallholder farmers. It's been extraordinary. It's a country I love that is on the brink of civil war, Tanzania, um, and, and certainly the United States. And so, you know, look at Armenia, Azerbaijan, yeah. We are in a very fragile moment, and at the heart of it is this fragility, anxiety, fear, and this growing divisiveness. I have gone through a genocide, and I see how fast it can move. And so this work that we all are doing, that all of you are doing, of using the tools of business, not ideologically, but in service of enabling other human beings to be their best selves, to free themselves. This is, this is the most important work we can be doing. And, um, and so seeing, you know, meeting people like you, Carrie, seeing, knowing the people that are on this, this, this call, um, that's what gives me hope. We have over 700 fellows around the world and all I have to do is go online and see what they're up to. And I think, okay, um, and now we just have to go faster. It would almost be hard not to be hopeful <laughs> when you see what the, right? It's yeah. impossible. And I've seen countries that have been decimated come back stronger, powerful, beautiful, and um, not perfect. Right. But that is the, that's the human journey. Now, on this human journey idea, you know, I noticed the theme of courage in a lot of personal stories that you told in your in your book, The Blue Sweater, and, and in the manifesto for Moral Revolution, your new book. You talk about how to practice courage in your work, especially through instances that feel scary or daunting or impossible to navigate through. Can you touch on this topic of courage in your own life and share with, with our folks here, especially the emerging entrepreneurs, how to best maintain strength in the face of adversity? 
Yeah, in, in, in a way, I talked about courage when you asked me about confidence because I see them as so connected. As I've got gotten, when I, when you're when I was younger, I think I was reckless, um, and that's different from being courageous. Um, and I think for so many of the young social entrepreneurs, you know what I'm talking about. There are times, there are moves that you make that are just reckless because you think, what do I have to lose? And then there are moves that you make that really take courage. And they may not look that way to the outside world. Um, for me, it was really easy to show up in a country very few people could place. The courageous thing was telling my parents that I was leaving this amazing job and going to do the work um, after 9-11 when um, uh, everybody was pulling back from the Middle East and, and afraid. We made the decision to go and work in Pakistan. I arrived in that country on, um, on the day that I opened the newspaper and I saw the beheading of the journalist Daniel Pearl from the Wall Street Journal. And I thought, okay, um, but that wasn't, it still wasn't courage. Courage was saying, I am gonna make a commitment to this place for the next 30 years. I'm gonna show up, we are gonna do what we can. We may fail and get kicked out, but it won't be because we didn't try. It was, that was the courage. And so I think as I've gotten older, Carrie, it's, it's recognizing that courage is when you do something you truly fear and you do it anyway. Reckless is when you throw the dice and you're, mm -hmm. you're on an adventure. Um, it doesn't hold the same level of um, responsibility. And, and so I think it's important as a social entrepreneur to almost listen to your bodies as to when you fear something, but you know you need to do it and you do it anyway, just keep walking toward it. And like everything else, the more you practice it, the better you'll get at it. Because there are times in every entrepreneur's life when your team doesn't agree with a decision that, that you know is right. And you can't play that card very often or you'll lose your team and you, and you should lose your team. But there will be moments when, um, and you might not even be able to tell them all the reasons that you have to do this other, this one thing. And that's when, again, having that, that, that person, mm -hmm. um, that may not be anywhere near your organization um, to withstand the anger and the hurt and the, the misunderstanding that will be around you. That's also courage. And, um, and again, what gives me hope um, and inspiration is that I look at people who just do the most courageous things in parts of the world that have been ravaged by war. They themselves have gone through horrendous experiences and and they act in courageous ways. And the final thing I'll say is I've also learned, and particularly during this pandemic, that sometimes just getting out of bed and getting on a Zoom call can be a phenomenal act of courage. And so when you're in those places, acknowledge that courage and, um, and give yourself a pat on the back. Um, because it's, it's not just the heroic glory courage that I'm talking about. I think the real courage comes in those moments of rebuilding yourself so that you can take on the hard stuff around you. And I also heard you saying, Jacqueline, that there's a courage in sticking with these sticking with it long term. You know, you get out of bed and you keep getting, I mean, you just keep getting out of bed and you keep getting on the Zoom and you keep, you stay with these communities for 30 years. Um, and there's this courage to keep going. Um, and part of that may be tying back to what you said, which is this focus on being interested rather than this focus on being interesting. And it's it's just really wonderful advice to share with people at any intersection along their journey. And we have audience members who wanted you to thank you for that. Mm. 
Well, it's oh. what you do too. And you never know when that moment will be when something happens and people then say, you know, you're part of us. Um, and you also never know when those people who you've accompanied, accompanied um, end up accompanying you. Jacqueline, we both know that uh, as it pertains to social impact, ideas are evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit about how we can all use our privilege to take a step and make the world a better place? In so many ways, big and small. Um, and this also goes to the outsider. You know, really the moral imagination is also putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So in tiny ways, we don't gather anymore, but um, the I've been to probably that conference you were talking about, Carrie, where fancy organizations will invite social entrepreneurs from around the world and, um, and we'll assume job done. I've got, I've given you access. Um, and now you're in this room with all these rich people, go for it. And they, and then I'll be in that room um, and I'll see social entrepreneurs who um, may not have a good command of English, aren't dressed like the fancy people. Um, I've never been in a room like that. And so go over it accompany them, find out who they are, um, introduce them to someone you think might actually be interested. Um, because I think there's a cruelty sometimes and we think that access is enough. It's not. We not only need to give each other access, but we need to build each other's capabilities to make use of that access. Um, you know, when we first started investing, um, in Africa, the, the, I had to learn that you know, we, people would point to these incredible expats and these great companies that they built. And I, I was the one that did it most of all. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I was like, well, wait a minute. They went to this, the schools where all the, the venture capitalists have all the money, they have the language, they look like them, and, um, and they, They've got a lot of safety net behind them, whether they came from privilege in a financial way or not. And so, you know, how do we then use our platform? How do we then use our privilege? Um, but it starts with that awareness at a very early stage where you can be using it every day to reach out and recognize that you can extend your privilege. I, I actually, Carrie, call it my social capital that acumen as financial capital, we have a lot of social capital now. Mm -hmm. And so when we built um, our first fellows programs, um, and now we have them in nine regions, but the deal that I made with local business people um, was local, the local community has to pay for it because if you really are excited by young leadership in your country, like show the world that. Mm -hmm. And number two, it would be extremely diverse across race, class, ethnicity, and religion. And that meant pulling people together who were raised to hate each other in some nations and certainly across nations. And, um, and, and, and really exploring the idea of identity, not in a way that is about identity politics, but in a way that we could really listen to each other, learn about each other, learn about th these different nations, um, to recognize that once you were in Acumen's community, you in many ways had a new identity and that was elite. As uncomfortable as that word is for uh, people, particularly who've been growing up fighting right. elites. And, um, and yet there's Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian author talks about genuine elites and counterfeit elites and how many counterfeit elites just have all this privilege and they use it for themselves. Genuine elites build the tools and the skills and, and do the work and show up and then use it on behalf of the world. And, um, and so for, for Acumen, it is building a platform on which we can 
extend opportunity to people who um, have so much to teach us, but who the world too often overlooks. And, um, and that's what we can each do, but you don't have to build some big global platform. Um, we can do it every single day in recognizing those around us who are not and extend ourselves. And, um, and again, um, approach them from a place of humility and curiosity and um, gratitude. Because I do think that this work is about our shared dignity. Jacqueline, thank you for an amazing conversation today. As always, uh, you continue to be an inspiration. Um, and for all of the listeners here, thank you for your very thoughtful questions. We're going to put Jacqueline's book um, in the link now, and you can see it in the chat box. And we will share all of your wonderfully thoughtful comments uh, with Jacqueline in the chat and questions. Thanks to all for taking your time today, and especially to you, Jacqueline, for your wonderful words moral courage and inspiration. Thank you, Carrie. I so wish that I could see everyone's face and um, hear about the work that you do because you are truly the hope for the future. And my hope is that my generation does a better job accompanying you and offering whatever wisdom we have learned and um, because it's gonna take all of us. So good luck to all of you. And Carrie, you truly are force of nature. What a privilege for me to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you.